Russia's been organising its spacecraft after a second leak was detected. SpaceX has been testing Booster 7 again. Japan failed to launch their brand new rocket. And much more is coming up in this edition of Tomorrow Space News. Well, what do we have here? A booster being fueled? How exciting. Sadly, we didn't get a static fire, but we did get a spin prime test of one Raptor engine. A spin prime is when the turbo pumps are spun up, but there's not meant to be any ignition. We've also gotten two beautiful full speed quick disconnect tests to observe. That was the first, and this is the second. It doesn't seem that impressive until you remember that the QD housing is the size of a small building. Sitting near the launch mount are these steel covers which are going to wrap around the OAM protecting all of the plumbing on the outside near the business end of the booster. They are currently being slotted over this section right here similar to how the pipes running up the launch mount lake have been shielded. It's getting exciting down on the space coast as the capsule launching SpaceX's Crew-6 mission has arrived at the Horizontal Integration Facility at Launch Complex 39A. Crew Dragon Endeavour was once again soaking up the spotlight as she prepares for her fourth mission. Her previous three have been Demo-2, Crew-2 and Axion-1. Japan's brand new H3 rocket finally made it to the pad after a decade of development last week. However, sadly, the inaugural launch was not to be. Shortly after igniting the two main engines and just a fraction of time before the solid rocket boosters were to ignite, the main engines were shut off and the vehicle went nowhere. As the saying goes, however, you'd rather be wishing that you were in the air on the ground than wishing you were on the ground in the air. We're still not sure why this launch attempt didn't go to plan, however I think everybody is grateful that it wasn't the SRBs which ignited because after that point you committed to going into the sky whether you wanted to or not. The H3 is intended to be a cheaper way of getting into space when compared to Mitsubishi's current workhorse, the H2A. And don't worry, the subfixes of different numbers are still here. The first number after H3 is the number of engines on the first stage. The second number is the amount of solid rocket boosters strapped onto the side. And the final character is a letter, either S, L or W, which stands for short fairing, long fairing and wide fairing. So now that we have that understood, the inaugural launch attempt was of the H322S variant, meaning it had two LE9 engines underneath the first stage, two solid rocket boosters on the side and a short fairing. Similar to NASA's SLS, the H3 is a hydrogen fueled vehicle and also like NASA's SLS, the H3 is going to be supporting the Artemis program. Japan's next generation HTV-X cargo resupply spacecraft will be launched on a future planned triple core variant of the H3 which will resupply the Lunar Gateway space station with cargo for the crew on board. Here's a positive story for Boeing Starliner. According to NASA's commercial crew program manager, they're 80% ready for their crew flight test, which is currently scheduled for April. Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams will be flying to the International Space Station on the United States' second commercial crew vehicle, similar to SpaceX's Demo 2 mission with Crew Dragon, which saw Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley fly to the ISS back in 2020. The only outstanding major issue yet to be addressed from Starliner's second orbital flight test is the orbital maneuvering and attitude control thrusters failing in the service module. Now being such an important system, you may be wondering why this issue hasn't been addressed yet and the answer is pretty simple. Unlike the capsule, the service module is jettisoned before re-entry and it doesn't survive the journey home. So unlike the other issues, teams on the ground can't inspect actual hardware. So instead, they've had to just go off the telemetry they had access to during the flight. This data is expected to have been fully reviewed by early March, ready for a mid to late April launch attempt that will fit in with ULA's schedule with the inaugural flight of Vulcan. Before we get into the week's orbital launches, here's a feel-good story from Rocket Lab. They've been using their helicopters, which are usually kitted out to try and catch spent stages falling back to Earth, to help with the response efforts following Cyclone Gabrielle, the worst cyclone to hit New Zealand since 1968, and the most expensive cyclone to ever strike in the Southern Hemisphere, with the current damages estimated to be around 8.12 billion, with a B, US dollars. Rocket Lab have been delivering food and essential supplies that they've been donating to Mejia, where their launch site is based, and other communities which have been affected by the cyclone. Luckily for the company, their facilities haven't been damaged, which they've acknowledged as being fortunate. Because of this, it also puts Rocket Lab in a stronger position to help out their fellow Kiwis. 
All of the traffic activity is focused around the end of the week, starting off with Starlink Group 2 Mission 5, which commenced at 19.12 Universal Time on Friday the 17th of February from Space Launch Complex 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. All 51 satellites were successfully delivered to their initial orbit and they'll soon be raising themselves to their final 570km, 70-degree low Earth orbits. The booster supporting this mission, the 1063, successfully returned to Earth by landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. Just a short while later, at 0226 UTC on Saturday the 18th, Progress MS-21 undocked from the Zenith port on the Poisk module and began its deorbiting procedure. This was the cargo resupply spacecraft which had a coolant leak which we reported on last week, so if you want to learn more about that, make sure to go and check out that episode of the news. As of 0315 UTC on the 19th, Progress MS-21 is no more, and all of the rubbish left on board has burnt up in the atmosphere. Less than two hours after the undocking of Progress MS-21, SpaceX was launching again, this time from the east coast of the United States with Inmarsat I-6F2 from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Commencing at 0359 UTC on Saturday, this mission successfully delivered the geostationary communication satellite to its geostationary transfer orbit. Once fully circularized, F2 will be able to communicate with the ground via its 9-meter aperture L-band antenna and its 9-ka band antennas. It's a busy week for departures coming up with ChinaSat 26 launching on a long March 3BE on Thursday. The first mission of Starlink Group 6 is also going up on Thursday. The fast-tracked emergency Soyuz MS-23 vehicle will be launching to the International Space Station on Friday. An unknown payload will also be launching on Friday on a long March 2C from Xiuquan. And Sunday will see the launch of the next four astronauts to the ISS with SpaceX's Crew 6 flight with American Commander Stephen Bowen, American pilot Warren Hoburg, Russian launch dynamics engineer Andrei Fidiev and Emirati ISS engineer Sultan Al Niedi. Thank you to the citizens of tomorrow, the wonderful financial backers who helped to keep Station 204 operating. If you want to access some epic perks, then make sure to head to the join button below or join.tmro.tv to see what takes your fancy. Of course, we know you all can't join our ground support, suborbital, orbital, escape velocity and Plaid Pro Plus ranks, but just sharing your content with your family and friends is a very useful and free way to help out the community. It's an exciting week coming up on the channel, as not only will Dr. Tamitha Scove be back with a brand new weather update, we'll also be back for our weekly live show this Friday night. If you're in a time zone that accepts 0100 UTC as a normal time of day to watch content, then make sure to come out and hang out with myself, Jared, Dutta, and maybe Jamie. Of course, next Monday, I'll also be back with some more news. We didn't really have that much SpaceX news this week, so this episode is a bit shorter, but thanks for tuning in anyways, and goodbye.